hymnal to go to 446 with me. We'll do this one satisfied and then get into uh, uh, the service and prayer requests and then into the praying and then into the scriptures tonight. 446. All right, come on, Joy. All my life. said this. I, by the way, if you travel from state to state or wherever, I guess, and perhaps you're traveling on a Sunday, it's dangerous to listen to First Bible Church when you're driving. 
I get excited when I hear you sing. Amen. I get even more excited when Pastor or one of our guys is preaching. I listen to Pastor going and I listen to Pastor coming back. And I found myself really doing really well in the speed limit, somewhere around 75. But every once in a while, 90 came up. <laughs> And my right leg was pushing that accelerator down, and I realized, okay, let's, let's tone it back just a little bit. Let's back the pony up just a little bit, all right? And, uh, but I, it was so, uh, some great messages, and, and uh, just such a joy. Uh, Pastor is, uh, he's, I, Lord willing, I guess he's already in Virginia. They went down to uh, get uh, Margaret's brother, Jesse, uh, reestablished back in his house. Uh, they were going to hire a cleaning service to come in and just clean the place, and they wanted to get his dogs back and all that. And uh, Margaret had said, uh, we spoke to Margaret, I spoke to both of them uh, prior to their leaving. Uh, when was it? I guess it was t t Tuesday? I guess maybe it was Tuesday, yes. And uh, they said, uh, Margaret had said he, uh, Jesse, uh, her brother, uh, was like a different man. Uh, she said, I, I didn't even realize it was his voice. And uh, he has a drinking problem and uh, had been in rehab. So just keep praying for Jesse, for his soul, that uh, Mike and Margaret, Pastor and Margaret, may have an opportunity to, uh, to speak to him uh, and give him some clarity in, in his mind. But from there, they were going to fly to, they were going to put the car somewhere and fly to... Uh, Florida to see his uh, pastor's sister. She's about ready to go back to Thailand. She'll be over there uh, for three three years, and pastor wanted to uh, speak to uh, his sister. So just uh, just keep them in prayer. Uh, I heard some prayer requests uh, concerning Betty Albano, that surgery, and, and uh, Marty Mannheimer being in the hospital. So keep all that in prayer. So let me just get my piece of paper out here. And is there anything else tonight that we need to, uh, to uh, pray about specifically? Keep, uh, not this Sunday, but keep the following Sunday, which I think is, I don't know why I want to say the 19th, I think that's correct. But we're going to do uh, open meeting on the 19th. That'll be the first open meeting that we've uh, had opportunity to do since we've been able to get back even in church here in the main auditorium. So just keep that, uh, uh, keep that in prayer. And I say this to you guys, brother. The boys, uh, quote unquote boys, who uh, had the really severe accident in Conville High School. And uh, just between that boys, one of them is still in the hospital, another guy helicopter to him, <laughs> another hospital, so he might lose his life. And he was driving 130 miles per hour. All right, let's keep, yes, yes, let's keep those young men in prayer. All right, anything, uh, anything else? Brother Gerard? Reconcile with the son and uh, the son's wife. Did I get that right? Okay. All right. Anything else tonight specifically? Yes. Yes. Uh, we have that. That's given to, actually, yeah, it's given to us the right of praying for those in leadership. Uh, we've talked about madness. Our country's in a state of madness. As I kind of jokingly said, it, for years I said it was crazy. Then it became bizarre, and it has escalated into absolute madness. Deuteronomy 28, 28, God gave Israel over to madness. And I think that's uh, at least what I can determine, and I think you watch it, it, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. <laughs> 
uh, and it's impossible to uh, to relate to madness. Mm -hmm. So just uh, this election coming up will be uh, tremendously interesting. Uh, we do not uh, politicize from this pulpit, you know that, and uh, we'll never tell you who to vote for, but uh, this will be an interesting time uh, in, uh, I think, in the history of our country. I don't know uh, the little bit of research that I can do whether uh, this has ever happened in the past simply because of COVID-19 and, and uh, whether we vote in, in, in our normal uh, uh, meeting halls, as church, uh, churches or schools or wherever, and, and, uh, or whether we do it electronically. It's, it's all up in the air. So just uh, our country needs prayer. And uh, we're the people that uh, uh, we're the people who need to humble ourselves. And uh, folks, uh, I'm still, I, I, you afforded, uh, our, I'm afforded the time to go to see my, my children. And I'll tell you what, it's uh, it, to just be able to drive from state to state to state. Nobody's stopping me. Nobody's, uh, you know, hindering us from movement, at least yet. And uh, uh, we dare not take our freedoms for granted. All right, great to be uh, free in Jesus Christ. That's the foremost thing. But, you know, we live in a country where we're still given the right to worship as, as we see uh, right. And, uh, but uh, we, need to, we need to pray that uh, God would just intervene in, in, in our hearts and in the hearts of our leaders. So just, yes, keep that, keep that in, uh, in prayer. All right, what else? Yes, Janet. All right, Allison and her mom for salvation. All right, yes, Lorraine? Loved ones, yes, lost loved ones. All right, anything else? Keith? Excuse me. Joe Daly. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Excuse me just for a moment here. Dropping things right in the middle of all this. All right. What else? All right. Uh, Pastor also mentioned, I know he mentioned it this Sunday as I was once again driving. I heard him mention, uh, I think he's, uh, and he said to me before he left, uh, Oh, I knew what I wanted to, uh, before that comment. Uh, 38,000 French Bibles are on their way to Haiti. Amen. All right, uh, 2,000, because we, we uh, got 40,000. 2,000 are coming to us, should be within us within the next several days, perhaps. But 38,000, uh, I saw the picture, uh, Pastor sent the picture on, on, uh, on our phones, and uh, they were loading uh, the, the, the truck at, uh, as the picture was being taken. So just keep that in prayer, and uh, that the seed and the sower would find good soil in, in Haiti, all right? They, uh, they've, uh, they've been uh, finished, they're on their way. But also keep, uh, keep the 17th, Pastor, because we weren't able to do kid stuff this year, uh, Pastor wants to do a very modified, uh, like children's hour, uh, some reading, some teaching, some games, perhaps. And uh, he mentioned it Sunday. There's more information to follow, so I don't have all the information. He was kind of uh, not sure of all the things he wanted to do. I know that Janice, Margaret's going to help him. Janice wants to help him. But uh, in lieu of kids stuff, simply because of this COVID thing, uh, we want our, uh, to give our children as much access uh, to, uh, to activities and, and, uh, and Bible time as we possibly can. It will be a very modified, it won't be anything like kids stuff, but very modified. 
but uh, he's excited about doing that. So keep, he did mention the 17th, I believe that's that Friday. As soon as he gets back, it's the Friday. Uh, by the way, uh, he uh, pre-recorded uh, the Friday night uh, lessons that he, uh, readings that he and Margaret do with our children. So just uh, keep, uh, keep all that in prayer. Okay, uh, brother. Sorry, a couple of things. Yes, yes. My brother Pat's wife was pregnant, saved for the Lord's hand of protection on that. Okay. Um, secondly, Jonas Moses, still mm -hmm. praying for him. And all you guys, the leadership and the ministry for the Lord's protection on that. And during these bizarre times, as you said, protection on our church. We're in a very, this is a very strange uh, time that we're in. And uh, uh, things are in such a flux. Uh, 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 nothing is stable in anybody's thinking. They still, nobody knows really what they're doing yet. And, uh, but they're, they're allowing us to meet again. And uh, I haven't, I'll be honest with you, I haven't followed all the stages and uh, I pastored said we had a good crowd here uh, Saturday or uh, Sunday morning, July the uh, was that July July the fifth, and uh, some of us were away obviously, but uh, you know it's uh, uh, you, you have to lose something to realize how special it is. You know we're we're a strange bunch of we're strange human human beings are a very strange specie, okay? And uh, we've all said that when we lost a loved one, that you never really, uh, you didn't realize how, how, who they, you know, what they meant to you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm really praying that uh, we'll get a new appreciation for just being able to be together uh, on a Wednesday night, on a Sunday morning. And uh, we need each other. I, 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 I'll throw this right to you. I need you. I need you. And I, I jokingly said from the pulpit and individually preaching and singing to an empty main auditorium, just ain't cutting it, okay? It's, it's just ain't cutting it. Uh, I, don't have the, uh, uh, I don't have the face for radio, okay? So, and, uh, uh, but uh, I would not be a good radio uh, preacher. It's just, it, I, I, it's, I can't do it, all right? It's just... Uh, uh, your being here, uh, I don't know how spiritual this sounds, but uh, I feed off of your presence. Uh, your, uh, your, it's that iron sharpening iron principle again. So just uh, let's continue to pray uh, for each other. And, and uh, Ruth, uh, Moses, just so you know, uh, th there's probably about an average of $1,000 a month uh, just a handful of our people. We don't do it corporately as a church body, but just a, a handful of people throwing money in and then na naming Ruth. And I sign the checks on Thursday most of the time. And about once a month, uh, the check goes to Ruth ever since the imprisonment of her husband. So just, uh, just keep all that uh, in prayer if it comes to your mind. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a moment, if we could, a brief moment here. Get together the twos, three at the most. I, uh, we'll break apart. Now we've got our congregation, at least part of our congregation, back on a Wednesday night. Let's go back into what we have been normally doing. And uh, then, uh, if you'll let me close in prayer and get into the Word.
meet together in, in your name and in your personage. Father, we are so grateful uh, for the allowance uh, that even those who are in authority uh, have given to us. Uh, Father, uh, I am reminded always that we are to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and render unto God's that which is God's. But Father, I want to say thank you that uh, we can meet together again, that we can look into each other's faces, Father, and, and uh, may the uh, months of absence, uh, the old adage of absence makes the heart grow fonder. Father, there are so many things that separate God's people, uh, just lack of love for one another, little petty differences. And Father, somehow, I pray in these months to come, if you permit, that uh, we will uh, let all that go and that we would, uh, there would be uh, one accord, one mind, one mouth, unity. Uh, in this place uh, that would uh, give the Spirit of God liberty to work. So, Father, the names, again, that have been prayed about, thank you. Thank you that we can name names, and, and even those that we do not even know, we can still lift them up. And I want to thank you. You said, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Father, thou art the God of the impossible. We th think we're in control when man is not in control at all. But Father, thank you. And even tonight as we study your word and get into it, pray that you would just, uh, your spirit of God, uh, thank you. He is our comforter, but he's also our teacher. And I pray for that teaching tonight, that preaching, Lord, that that you would give us just to order our steps in your word, give us direction. Uh, Father, uh, open our, help us not only to hear, but to hearken. Uh, Lord, uh, may, may we realize that it is so exciting to talk about the coming of the Lord, and it is absolutely needful in every age. But as we, as we get closer to that trumpet, Lord, May we uh, take a good look at our lives, and uh, Father, may we, uh, may we be that written epistle, as my one sister said tonight, because that's the only Bible most people will ever read, is our lives. So Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. It's always wonderful to see my children, but my beloved church family just uh, is uh, such the bigger part of my life, really. And uh, I'm thankful to be home again with my church, my beloved church family. Pray for Mike, Pastor, Margaret, Lord, as they've gone for Jesse. Lord, open Jesse's heart to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, uh, deliver him uh, from his darkness, Father. May he realize that uh, only Jesus Christ can change a life. Uh, it takes more than just uh, some revolution to, uh, to, to a, a creed, Lord. It takes the personage of Christ, really, to make him free. May the truth make him free, I would ask, Father. And as they go to Florida, Father, once again, mercies and travel, Give them a good time with uh, Pastor's sister. And uh, we will thank you, Father, if you would be pleased to bring them home again. I think of Joanne Termina tonight again. I think of Cora. I think of Bobby and all the grandchildren, Frank Jr., his wife, Lord. Father, thank you uh, for a hope that goes beyond this mortal house of clay. There are no goodbyes for Christians. It's just I'll see you on the other side. Those men who will take over and young men and women who will, who will help in that print shop, 
Lord, I pray you give them a Holy Ghost movement. May we realize that this work is not mechanical. It is spiritual, Lord. Father, thank you. In Jesus, thank you for those 38,000 Bibles going to Haiti. May the seed and the sowers find good soil. The 2,000 we get, I pray the same, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 with me. Just as a comment of introduction. 2 Timothy. The Timothys, second, first and second, are the last of Paul's writing. If you have a Bible with dates in it, as I do, it's somewhere around 66 A.D. And, and it's the last of his writings. And he says in 2 Timothy, I want to read chapter 3. There's a word that I want to kind of capitalize on tonight, a very common word. And as I was, you know how you think, you, you, you see something, then you say to yourself, I've done this before. <laughs> so somewhere back in the archives of my messages, you've probably got this message on this word. I couldn't remember, it just it stuck in my brain. The heart of what we're going to talk about tonight is continuing. Continuing. It, it, it's, it's found in, but there's a word that keeps appearing right at the beginning of many books of your Bible. And I think sometimes we overlook it. But I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want to read 1 through 8, all right? And we've read this again many times. Now, we're, the word perilous is going to come up. And perilous is, is uh, the perils, second, I think it's 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul talks about the perils that he went through. And the very word perilous simply means uh, ultimate danger and, and high risk and, and something that's extremely hazardous. It's one of those, it's one of those uh, uh, words that amplifies uh, risk even and, and hazardous. It, it's perilous, something that's in grave jeopardy or something that will cause extreme injury. All right? It's perilous. And in 66 A.D., now think... Try to put yourself, when you read your Bible, where he's writing at. If you think it's bad now, back in 66 A.D., the Apostle Paul writes to a young pastor, Timothy, all right, that he didn't win, win Timothy to Christ, but he's, he's pretty much been the man in Timothy's life. Timothy was, was raised by a, a grandmother and a mother. His father was a Greek. We know absolutely nothing of his father other than the Bible says he was a Greek. All right, the Greeks seek after wisdom. I'm going to just believe he wasn't born again. He wasn't saved. So Timothy comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ really through two women. And he doesn't have a man in his life until he meets the great apostle Paul. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud. Almost seems like we're reading, nobody reads newspapers anymore. Almost seems like you're, you're scanning the world wide web, all right? Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. It's amazing that he would stick that right in there. I'm unthankful. That's one of the ways how you know that a generation is... Is it's a, it's 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 when so, it's unthankful. It's hard to find anybody thankful today. All right. Now I'm sure they're out there, and I know you are. All right. But uh, uh, it's it's one of the earmarks of of when a society is about ready to be destroyed. They're just unthankful. All right. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, meaning they simply couldn't hold themselves, fierce, 
I've got this, I've got this one that I really do have underlined in. Despisers of those that are good. Isaiah would say about calling evil good and good evil. It's like everything is flipped upside down today. And I, I will be honest with you, it bothers me. At my age, and I'm 70, you know that, so I've lived long enough now, uh, this, this whole thing is turned, it's, it's, it's upside down. Something's wrong. Despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, so, so now we get a little, a little religious here, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women. Ladies, I'm in your favor, but this is what it says. Silly women, all right? Those who could... It, the devil did not go to Adam in the garden. He went to Eve. All right? A weaker vessel, the Bible says. Not an inferior vessel. I'm gonna, I'm, I, I don't want to get any hate mail, okay? My wife is ten times smarter than I'll ever be, all right? A woman's not inferior, but she has a, she has a character about her inherently from God that can be easily deceived. For of this sort, they, 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 they creep into houses, verse 6, lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning, I have this one underlined too, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I, there's never been a generation, probably, only from the very beginning, where who knows what the Tower of Babel looked like, but this generation, we don't, a pastor said it Sunday morning about teaching and preaching. I did listen to it, believe me. Our church does not lack information. We do not lack teaching. But have you come to the knowledge of the truth? You say, well, I'm saved. Well, that's a good start, but that's the bottom rung on the ladder. That just got you in the family. There are many wrongs on this ladder. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as, now watch this. Now, and I think verse 8 is really where I want you to see this. Did you notice what I just said? I just re read by it. Here's my operative word. Now. Now. He has said all these things and now he says now. As Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, the word now implies a connection of the present with the former. It's a, it's a revealing of a continuation. And I'm going somewhere with this. Please stay with me. We're going to get a little tedious in doing something here. Just, just a little bit here. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do, the, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Enough free. Now, now. God wants, God wants us to continue. If I was not saved, it appears today in our nation that things are absolutely out of control. I don't know who to trust anymore. You may have a desire to look at conservative channels, what's called conservative channels. Let God be true and every man a liar. Who's telling me the truth? It appears to me that I can't trust anybody from telling me the truth. It seems like things are out of control. But God is controlling the continuation. I was taught an adage. It's not new. You, as soon as I start it, you'll know exactly what it, where, where I'm going with it. You never doubt in the darkness what God has told you in the light. Mel used to say, our founding pastor used to say, when it gets dark down here, really dark, it gets really good in heaven. When things get bad down here... It's getting really good in heaven. 
And from what I can determine from Scripture and looking at the past and asking God just for light in this thing, God isn't seated on His throne anymore. He's standing. He's standing like He did before. And He's ready to come out. When Stephen was stoned, you go back and read that, that chapter in the book of Acts, Stephen saw him standing. He was ready to step out of heaven, but didn't do it at that time. God's in control. That word now, because right now it seems like, man, things are bad. Where's this going to go? People are, we're on the street corner. And we've joked about this. Where once they threw us the Bronx chair, a certain digit on your hand, now they're giving you a thumbs up. Because they believe things are ending. Things are so bad, they're out of control. They don't even realize, at minimum, we got another thousand years. you got the millennial reign of Jesus Christ yet ahead of us, plus 42 months of great tribulation. That's still, And there may be more than that. But the way this is looking, it is looking very, very bad. Now, go to Exodus chapter 1. Now, we're going to do some, some book flipping, all right? I want you to go to Exodus chapter 1. I, I want you to see how many of your books in your Bible start. Now, the book of Genesis ends with a coffin. We've said that more than once here. It ends with a coffin. That's a pretty sad thing. Joseph's dead, great type of Jesus Christ, probably the purest of all types in your Old Testament of, of Jesus Christ is Joseph, but Joseph is dead. And if I was going to just stop my reading at Genesis chapter 50 and verse 26, and he, put, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt, that's a sad commentary right there. It's over, it's done. But I want you to look at Exodus chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel. Look at verse number 8. Now, there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. You know what God's going to, was trying to show us there? God isn't done. He's going to continue. Look at... Uh, I just, I, I tried to go through book, book by book just to see. Go, look, can I show you Joshua 1.1? 1, 1? Flip to Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. I know this, this will appear to be a little tedious, but uh, once I saw this, because, you know, sometimes, sometimes even anybody, you can get stuck in the, we, we, we sing about the sweet by and by, but you know where we have to live? In the nasty now and now. Okay. I don't want to sing about the nasty now and now. I sing about the sweet by and by. But for the last 50 years as a born-again believer, I've been stuck in the nasty now and now. Dealing with all the, 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 the craziness and then the, the bizarre attitude and now the madness. But God's not finished. God's still at work. Amen. And remember, when it gets bad down here, when it, and when it gets bad down here, by the way, don't be afraid, but you're included. We're going to get caught in this bad. Okay? But God's about ready to step out of heaven. Now, look at Joshua chapter 1. All right? Now, we've gone through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and those books were just amplifications of, 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 the, the, of the worship and, and how they were worshipped and how they were to walk. And then Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law. But look how the book of Joshua starts. Now! <laughs> it looked, it look, guess, who, guess who had just died in the last chapter of Deuteronomy chapter 34? Moses, the great prophet. He's dead. Oh my word! What are we going to do? And Joshua chapter 1 says, Now, God says, let me, con 
Let me show you I'm continuing this story. Now let me throw this just out. And I think this was said by a late preacher, Ravi Zacharias, who died recently, went home to be with the Lord. And he made this comment in one of the last messages that he preached. The worker will pass, but the work will go on. The worker will pass, but the work will go on. All right. But we get caught up with the worker now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto who? Joshua. All right. Look at Judges. Another book. We're not looking at chapters. I'm, I want you to see, the next time you read your Bible, if you haven't seen this, kind of realize, you know your Bible is a whole continuation? I'm, I'm deliberately going to go through these. Is a whole... Now look. Now, now oh my word, Joshua, Joshua was dead. What are we going to do? Well, look at Judges chapter 1. And verse number 1. Now, God says, don't worry about it. I'm continuing. The story's going on. The work's going to go on. Man's going to pass. Women are going to pass. The worker's going to pass. One day they won't. But right now they are. But the work's going on. Now, after the death of Joshua, what does he do? He raises up judges. All right, look at Ruth chapter 1. All right, find, find the book of Ruth. Now, Ruth is, Ruth is written during the time of the judges, and it's one particular family that God wanted to emphasize from the book of Judges, and it's this book of Ruth, Ruth being that Gentile type of the, the bride of Christ, ends up marrying Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. So here we have this wonderful four chapters of the pictures of, picture of the church. Look how it starts. Do you think that God just didn't know another word? We're talking about the eternal wordsmith here. You talk about... I've, I, I've been around some... John Kennedy, they said, was, was so articulate he could speak like 600 and some words in a minute. I mean, you talk about articulate. He was articulate. I'm, Pastor Mike is articulate. I'm not articulate. He's articulate, man. He can spin the truth and tell it with words. He paints a picture and I hang on every word. You would think God could come up with a better word. But he didn't, because you know what God wants to do? He wants to tell you, right in the middle of your heartache, he's going to continue to work. Right in the middle of COVID-19, you, you think COVID-19 is moving God off the throne one inch? Come on. Right in the middle of your and my individual heartache, you know what, you know what we need to remember? God's not done. My wife's constantly, constantly reminding me that God hadn't written the last chapter yet. Whether it's in your life or my life or in our church's life, the last chapter's not been written. Sometimes we get so bound up in our heartache, we don't see any, any light. And I go back to that, that, that saying, never doubt in the darkness what God has told you in the light. If you ever needed to read your Bible, First Bible Church, and anybody listening to my voice tonight... If you ever needed to read your Bible, it's today! And yes, I will get excited. And yes, I will have a black and blue mark when I go home. That's what blood thinners do to you. So shut your TV off. Who watches TV anymore? Shut your phone off. Shut your computer off. Potty the dog. And take one hour and sit down with God. Because he's coming. Amen. Second greatest event that's ever hit planet Earth is about ready to happen. Amen. I've been waiting for 50 years for this. 
might have to wait a little longer. Who knows? Maybe not. But are you ready? Did you ever have a guest, guest come? Let me, let me get it off on a rabbit trail, just a small one. Did you ever have a guest come to your house? Whether it's a relative you haven't seen for a while, but somebody, somebody you, you've invited him to your house, or, or they, you've invited them. Can I, let, me, let me just throw this out. What, is, what, what are you doing in your house? What, what, say, brother. You're cleaning, aren't you? The Lord's coming. You know what He wants to do? You know what He wants us to do? Clean the house. Now, this is not His house. You're His house. I'm His house. Clean the house. There you go, Brother Pat, always telling me how to live. No, I didn't tell you. You, you want to live like a junkyard dog? That's your business. But I plan on going to heaven clean. Clean the house. Clean the house. Go to Ruth. I've got you, Ruth. Look at 1 1. Now it came to pass when, when, uh, in the days when the judges were. Now, now. Go to 1 Samuel with me. Oh, my word. God stuck. God's scribe got stuck. Look at 1 Samuel. Look at 1 Samuel. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. Now Samuel's the last of the judges, and Samuel's also called in the Hebrew Bible the first book of Kings. There's like four, four of those books. In our English Bible, we have it separated. But look where it starts. Now, there was a certain man of, and on and on and on. Now, now, here's another one. Go to, uh, go to 2 Samuel. All right, 1 Samuel is all about who? Saul. 1 Samuel is about Saul, really. They wanted a king. They got a king. Was he a good king? No. Saul was a type of the natural man. You get to 2 Samuel, you know who replaces Saul? David. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 1. Oh, my word, God is stuck. I get accused sometimes of repeating myself. Get over it. That's the first thing I want to say to you. Get over it. Get over it. Because you know what I've just discovered? God's got no problem repeating himself. No problem at all, man. And you know why he repeats himself? Because I don't get it the first time. Or the second time. Or the third, fourth, fifth. Keep numbering time. Okay. Second Samuel. Oh, my word, what are we going to do? Saul is dead. God now is going to give him the king that God always wanted them to have, other than his own self. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul. When David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David abode, uh, had abode two days in Ziklag. Now, God wants to continue. I know this is getting a little... Laborious? Laborious? Tedious? I'll use that word. Tedious. Go to, go to 1 Kings chapter 1 with me. 1 Kings chapter 1. Do you think God's not written this book? He wants it to continue. He wants you to continue. We're going to look at that too. God never starts something that He doesn't finish. He never starts... I'm going to be honest with you. I've started project projects. They're still they were 15 years ago, and I still haven't finished them. I'm praying that somebody else comes along and finishes what I started. Okay. We all do that. We'll start something. We we used to make fun of a. I won't even say the. I I, I would I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, embarrass Jimmy Scroy for anything. One of the finest carpenters that God ever put on the face of this earth is Jimmy Scroy. My house has been repaired by Jimmy Scroy. My deck is built by Jimmy Scroy. It's over 20 years old and still wonderful. But, but have you ever went in Jimmy Scroy's house? Molding isn't up. And it became the joke in the Scroy family that Jimmy's finishing everybody else's project but can't finish his own. 
And Jimmy, I don't know if you've listened to this, but I love you, brother, but you're the greatest illustration I can think about though, at this time. <laughs> and we're friends. I can get away with that stuff. God wants us to continue. Go to 1 Kings chapter 1. Now King David was old and stricken in years, <coughs> excuse me, and they covered him with clothes, and on and on and on. And you find out, okay, now, now there's going to be other kings. It's going to be Solomon. But David's dead. It says, now. That's a word of continuation. It's a connection between the former and the present looking into the future. Here's another one. Go to Ezra 1.1. Now, the Lord willing, I, I, I've been really looking and, and giving Ezra and Nehemiah a considerable amount of thought in the last several weeks to months. Second Chronicles, the last chapter, chapter, what is it, 36. is the saddest, one of the saddest chapters in all the Bible. And it looks like it's over. And if you looked around verse number 15 of Second Chronicles, it's right across the page. I hope it's across the page in your Bible. It is in mine. It says that in verse 15, it says, The Lord God of their fathers sent to them uh, by His messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because He had compassion on His people and on His dwelling place. God was just absolutely good to them. But they mocked the messengers of God, verse 16 despised his words, misused his prophets, until the wrath of the, of the Lord rose against the people, till there was, there was no remedy. That's a, terrible, that's a terrible clause. Till there was no remedy. No remedy. Done. It's over. It's done, man. There ain't no fixing this deal. It's done. That's not how God did this. You go down there in verse number 21. It says, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah unto the land, uh, had enjoyed her Sabbath for as long as she lay desolate. She kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten. There's your 70 years of captivity, the Babylonian captivity of Judah. Look at verse 22, and then Ezra 1.1. 1, 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, Wait a minute. You had Nebuchadnezzar. That was Ezekiel and Daniel. You had uh, Darius, or also called Darius. All right. That was the next, next administration. But then you had Cyrus. Now, he's not a Jew, by the way. He's not a Hebrew. He's not from a part of Israel. But you know what God did? God wanted the story to continue. So you know what he did? He reached down into the heart and the spirit of the king of Persia. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. The, look what it says there. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now you're right at Ezra 1.1. 1, 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. God resurrected Israel. It looked so bad. It was bad. It was so bad, beloved, that if you go back into the, into the Kings and the Chronicles, do you know what some of the women were doing? They were so hungry. You know what a span is, by the way? A span is the, different, the distance between the tip of your thumb and your little finger. That's a span. These women were having babies born prematurely, you know what they were doing? It says they were, eating their, they were eating their babies of a span. It was so bad. They were eating their, their, their babies that were being almost aborted out of them. Terrible. How bad, how much worse could it get? It's over. There's no remedy. Oh yeah, but God. I don't know what you're going through tonight. We all know each other pretty well. Some of you have carried diseases. My family has carried diseases, cancers, problems. And boy, it looks dark. 
and it looks almost hopeless. And you're, you're going through all kinds of therapies to try to kill a disease, and, and, and that which they're giving you to kill the disease is killing you. And sometimes a person goes home. Sometimes the Lord just says, okay, I want them home, and they go home. And it looks so dark. And it looks like there's no hope. But every time I read my Bible, I find that word now. Now, now, now. Let me just, let me go, to, let me take you to Ezekiel. I, I know we're, we're being a little laborious with this, tedious. I, I don't know if that's the right way to pronounce that word, but laborious, laborious, who knows, I don't know. Let's use the word tedious. I know how to pronounce that. Look at Ezekiel chapter 1. Now remember the captivity. The captivity is... During the captivity of Babylon, Babylonian captivity, captivity of Judah, that's Ezekiel and Daniel. And we, we, what we just read at the end of Second Chronicles was they were, they were just coming out of it. But if I could just go back and put them back into it, look at Ezekiel and Daniel, especially Dan, uh, Ezekiel. Now. It came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day, and he goes on and on and on. It's, he's, he's, he's raising up Ezekiel now, now, because Ezekiel became the prophet. It's a prophet they didn't want, a prophet they didn't want to hear, but God raised him up. Now, let me jump you ahead to Matthew chapter 1. Do you know there's 400 years? Remember what we taught about uh, the last word in Genesis was coffin? The last word in Malachi is curse. That's a terrible thing. And there's 400 of si it's called the 400 silent years. I read a book years ago by Ironside. He wrote on the 400 silent years. And the synagogue pretty much came out of the 400 silent years. But they were so lost spiritually. They had lost their identity in those 400 years. It seemed hopeless. And all those things that were written about this Messiah and, and who he was, you know, Isaiah 53 and Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis, uh, Psalm chapter 22 and all the things in, in Zechariah and all the things said in Joel. It's like, how could it? It's 400 years. It's a long time. Look at Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse 18. You think God's finished? You think God, some of you think God's finished with you. He hasn't even begun sometimes. I'm going to throw this out, forgive the personal part of it. In 2007, my wife and I believed we were done. Okay, We were done in this ministry. Donna had gone home, what was it, 2003, and I felt it necessary in my heart to stay with Pastor Mike as his assistant for the next, what was it, four years. 2007 rolls around, and it seemed like the opportunity and the door was opening in North Carolina. I wanted to make up some time with boys that I knew. My, who, I call them boys. My oldest boy now is 50. Okay, they're not boys anymore, but they're my boys. And I was going to make up some time with them. And I sat in Pastor Mike's office, my wife and I, and said, we're done. We've, we've, we have finished this thing. Okay, whatever, 30-some years, okay. It isn't like we were sitting on our hands, but we, we believed in our heart we were done. And four years after leaving here, Mike Veach asks me to come back because, you know, I believe I was done. Sometimes you think you're done with something, and God says, no, you haven't even started yet. 
you haven't even started yet. And in 2011, we came back. All right? I was asked to come back. I didn't beg to come back. North Carolina is a lovely state, by the way. I was growing to like it. And by the way, if you read our website, I did not retire. I was working 15-hour days with three boys half my age, six days a week, trying to make a living. That ain't retirement to my, the Bahamas or Aruba or some cabin on the back of some lake where nobody knows your name is retirement to me. Okay. And Michael can make fun of my rocking chairs on my front porch all he wants. All right. But you know what? We think God, we, we, think, we think we're finished. We're done. It's not going to happen anymore. Then all of a sudden I come back and the man asks me to help him pastor. He says, I don't need an assistant. <laughs> and I don't need an associate. And forgive this personal part, but I thought I was done. Literally, I closed this book and put it on the shelf and said, Thank you, Lord. I loved you. You let me serve here for 30 some years. God said, We haven't, even, what, are you, what are you talking about? Take the book off the shelf. We haven't even started yet. You think you're done. And God says, No, no I haven't even begun. You think God's done with this globe? He hasn't even begun. God's about ready to, to set this globe aright. You know why I want Jesus Christ to come? I want somebody to run this world correctly. Righteously. In the name of holiness. That honors a godly life. I want my king to run this world and it's just about ready to happen and I can't wait see God's not done and he's not done with your life Matthew look at Matthew 118 400 years God didn't say a word Whew, that's a long time I go through one day without speaking to my wife or my wife speaking to me it's like what happened are you mad at me what I do? That's what she says to me. You okay? You mad at me? Did I do something wrong? And no, I'm just, you know, I, I can, I can, I grew up with a father. He's part Blackfoot Indian. He could sit there for 30 days and not say anything to anybody. That's just the way I, I got that vein in me, okay? It's like 400 silent years. God didn't utter anything. He closed Malachi and he was done. But he wasn't done. Look at 118. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Now, look at chapter 2 and verse number 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Now, now. You see, God's in control. Now, let me give you one more. Just one more. Time, we're, we're okay. Don't worry about that. You, I hope you ate. Did you eat tonight? I hope you ate tonight. Okay. I ate too, but I'll go home and I'll have my favorite meal. It's called peanut butter and jelly. Go to Revelation. Go to Revelation. Nothing like a, a good black coffee and a big old peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Nothing like it after you preach, boy. Damn. Revelation chapter 12. God's gone through the 42 months of great tribulation with, uh, with four different uh, uh, likenesses. And he's in the, the seven of the personages. He's talking about Israel and Satan and the child and the archangel. And he talks about the, uh, the Jewish remnant here. talks about the beast. But I want you to look at 1210. Because in all of this heartache, you know who appears? Look at 12 ton, 10. So Michael's in heaven. There's war in heaven in verse 7. 
Michael, his angels, they fought against the dragon, that Satan dragon fought against it, prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. The great dragons cast out, and the old serpent called the devil, Satan deceived the whole world, cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now look at verse number 10. And I heard a loud voice saying, it's, he's gone through this, this great tribulation four times, he's at the end of this with, with these personages. He says, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now... <laughs> is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night, day and night. You know what God starts? He always finishes. It's one of His names. He talks about in Hebrews 12 too. Pastor will get to it one day soon, perhaps. <laughs> I know he's listening to this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take some flack. For, you know. I've got I, I to make fun of somebody. You won't let me make fun of you. So I can. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 2 starts out and says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher what of our faith, what God starts, he always finishes. Can I take you to Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6? You think God's done with you. He's not done with you. He's probably just beginning. Some of our brothers and sisters have gone home. I think Pastor started to number them up, and I have to look at the number he came up with. Seventy some in forty-five years, we've buried seventy some of our people. That's a lot of people. But you want to know something? When your work ends down here, it just begins on the other side. Don't think you're going up there for rest and relaxation. Okay. Now, there won't be any sweating up there, and, and I don't know about the work that goes, but the governments, there's no end to them. And if you've loved him and served him down here, you know what he's going to do? He's going to give you an opportunity to reign up there. And you're going to have the opportunity to be over, to, 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 to like shepherd some people up there. Okay. So this thing is going to go on and on and on and on and on. But let me say this also. Sometimes we think hell is the end of things for the unbeliever. Hell is a never-ending crucible. It's going to go on and on and on and on. You will always be in pain. You will always be thirsty. You will always be in torment. It will never end. Boy, I tell you what, I wouldn't want that. You've got to get on the winning side, folks. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse 6. God wants this thing to continue. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ, until that rapture. God's working your life. You're not in control. I'm not in control. America's not in control. China's not in control. COVID-19's not in control. God's in control. Continue. Let me, let me just give you some conditions of continuation. Just, I, I'm, I'm going to just read part of these verses. If you went to John chapter 8, and he talks about, and in verse number 31, is, he says this, If ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. He didn't, he didn't say if you believe my word. He said if you continue continue. These are conditions of continuation. If you continue in my word. If you look at another one in James chapter 1 and verse 25, part of the verse says this, looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He says, the rest of that verse has to do with if he, being not a forgetful hearer looking into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein 
and says something to the effect of not being a forgetful hearer. Looking, continuing. If you went into 1 John chapter 2, verses 8 through 18, we need to do, we need to look at that. We'll go to 1 John. There's no way I can quote that, and I'll quote it badly. Go to 1 John. Go to 1 John chapter 2. And I want to read uh, verses 18, 10 verses, 18 through 28. He says, little children, it is, it is the last time. And you have heard that Antichrist shall come, and even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. He, now, I, I just want you to go down and read verse 24 with me. Because he said about, in verse number 19, no doubt they would have continued. But look at verse number, look at verse number 24. He says, let that therefore abide in you, because he's talking about the Son and the Father. In 22, he says, He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. 23, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. 24 now, Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that, if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. You know, there's a lot of Christianity very confusing to me today, all right? Very few churches are really focusing primarily on, on three things, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? The Word of God. We'll do everything else to put people in chairs. We cannot let society start dictating how we're to conduct church. That's extremely dangerous. That's what Israel did. It let prophesy unto us smooth things. Okay. Go to Acts chapter 2. Conditions of continuation. Continue in my word. Perfect law of liberty. Continue therein. Continue in the Son and in the Father. Go to Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 2 and look around verse 42. This was the primitive church. Now the church had probably three growths. It went from Jerusalem to Antioch to the, to the, uh, the mature church of Ephesus. Our church would be likened after the church of Ephesus. We don't have, we don't have uh, uh, what, what I want to say. I just forgot the word. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, we're... My word, I just forgot. Apostles. Apostles. Thank you, dear brother. All right? That's called old-timers disease. Okay. Yeah, old-timers. Got it. Right. We don't have apostles. We have pastors and deacons. That's what the book of Ephesus was supposed to have, the mature church. But there are four things mentioned here that can carry on from the Jerusalem church to the Antioch church to the to the Ephesus church, the mature church. Only four things. Four things that, were they primitive? Yeah, that was the beginning of it. But God had perfected these four things. Our church today should revolve around these four things. Look at Acts chapter 2. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, so it was the apostles, but it was their doctrine. Fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Only four things are mentioned there. If you look at verse number 46, 
It says, And they, continuing daily, with one accord in the temple, all right, primitive church again, breaking bread from house to house that eat their bread, eat their meat, excuse me, with gladness and singleness of heart. Four things that put them in one accord with each other. Now, there are a lot of things that we do, and, and they're not bad. Don't, don't, don't think I'm implying that. But at the heart of everything that we do needs to be doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. That's the simplicity now, in today's Christianity, that's tremendously boring. Boring to tears. Let's bring in some smoke coming out of the pulpit area. Let's paint the ceiling black. Let's put uh, a ballroom spinning globe. Let, let's turn our main auditorium into a nightclub. That'll get them to come. Those things had no place in God's church at all. But they're in the church today. Conditions. Let me give you just three, and we're running out of time. Let me give you three. Those were the conditions, some of the conditions of, 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 of a continuation. God wants us to continue. This now. Now is, is the present that something's moving from the past, the previous, into the present. You know what the Bible says about, the Bible says a lot about taste. Taste. Do you know a, taste is one of your senses? Taste is one of those things, it's experiential. You know, most things in life are experiential. When, when the Bible says, taste and see, that, uh, that, that the, Job 34.3, if I can quote, read some of it, says, for the, uh, for the ear trieth words as the mouth tasteth meat. Psalm 34.8, that's that gold standard verse, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that yeah, trusts in him. Those things are experiential. Pastor brought something up Sunday morning. You know what teaching is? It's really intellectual. Teaching really won't move your heart. You know what moves your heart? Preaching. Come on, let's do this! Now, we don't like that. But you know, we, I need to be motivated. You know why? Not, you know one of the reasons I need you here in church? I, I won't lie to you. I'm, I, I'm a man of many faults and flaws. So you, all, you, you know that. You motivate me. I can get into this pulpit and not want to be in this pulpit on a Sunday morning. Whether I'm leading music, and I don't do that very often anymore, but occasionally I do it. But every once in a while I lead music or, or I'm preaching and I'm saying, you know what, I don't want to do this this morning, Father. And I would dare say when you get into your cars, don't lie to me. Don't lie to yourself. When you, got, when you were wiping the tears, of tears, the sleepers out of your eyes and said, oh man, i got to go to church again this morning. Oh, I would rather stay at home. Lord, I love you, but I don't want to go to church. You think I'm any different than that? I have my mornings. I'm not going to lie to anybody. I'll, I won't, I'll be honest with you. I'll be brutally honest. I ain't going to lie to you. I don't always want to be here. But you know what happens when I get here? Amen. Woo! There you go. Somebody said that. There you go. It's like God takes me out of first gear. Because, you know, I, I'm, an old, I'm an old muscle car guy. You can only run first gear so long. And then you're going to blow the engine up. And all of a sudden God says, shift that sucker to second, Pat. You know, work that clutch. Pull it down the third. Pull it up the fourth. Pull it down the fifth. And by the time I get it in fifth gear and I'm looking back and some of you are looking like I'm crazy. Tommy, you're looking like I'm crazy right now. And I got news for you, brother. I am. 
I'm totally, I am absolutely nuts. I got I, But you know what you do for me? You know what this place does for me? It motivates me. It motivates me. That's why Mike talks about, he made this comment, and I, 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 I really wanted to challenge him on it. I didn't. And coming back when he offered, when he asked me, Deb and I, to help him and Margaret, and he looked at me and he had that little, he had that beach smirk on his face. That bearded beach smirk. And he said, if you can get off your front porch, off your rocking chair. I didn't even have time to sit on my rocking chairs down there. But you know what he was trying to do? He knew the button. You know, you know what people, they know what button to push. If you've got children, there's probably one of your kids that knows the buttons to push. He knew what button to push. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this place motivates me. Your presence motivates me. Your attitude motivates me. Oh, I got my doctrine. I probably don't have it all right. I know that for sure. I'm sure we'll get to heaven and God say, you know, you were a little off on that one, boys. <laughs> you, were, you were a tad off on that one, too. You know, don't, don't ever think you got everything right. But preaching? Motivate. It's experiential. Taste. Psalm 119, 103 says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. 1 Peter 2, chapter 2 and 3 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is great. You know this Bible is, is experiential. I'm glad we've got all this good teaching and we've had it for 45 years, but is it changing me at all? <laughs> is it helping my walk at all? Is it motivating me at all? <laughs> at all. When the Bible says I'm a written epistle, is that changing me to realize, you know what? People are reading my life. Your life. Would they be able to go to heaven just by reading my life and your life without ever opening this book? The Bible's experiential. Here's another one. How about, how about the test? You know the Bible is a proving, talks a lot about tests, proving grounds, trials, examination. If I looked at this, I wrote this experiential, I said it. But you know what a proving ground is, a trial? It's an examination. 2 Corinthians 8.8 8 talks about to prove the sincerity of your love. Go to, go to Deuteronomy. We're still in good time. I'll get you that peanut butter sandwich. Don't worry about it. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. You know the things that you've gone through and the things that you're going through and the things that you will go through and me. They're not to crush us. And I've said this they're not to destroy us. They're to draw us. God's trying to prove you. You know that illustration of the silver where the silversmith is asked, how does he know it's when it's pure? And he, he's heating it up and he's cleaning off the dross. And the person said, well, how do you know when it's pure? And he said, when I can see my reflection in the silver, then I know it's pure. And when Jesus Christ can see his reflection in you and I, then it's pure. All right. It's all this is a proven ground. This whole thing down here is boot camp, folks. I don't care how you cut it. This is boot camp. This is the wilderness. This is the night. This is not the promised land. Some of us may live like it's the promised land. And there's nothing wrong with having things. Just don't let the things own you. Because if God would so choose to say, listen, you've got to give that thing up, would you be willing to do it without, 
without fussing. <laughs> Prior to our coming to New York in 1975, Deb and I were going to buy our first home. It was ours. I had got the bank note, I got everything, and I was just ready to sign on the dotted line, and then God told me, God said, why don't you go to New York with Mel Sabaka? Hmm. So we didn't sign on a dotted line. And I made people mad at me, some good friends, because they had helped us get this house. A little simple blue-collar house, blue-collar neighborhood that Deb and I grew, that I grew up in. All right, she grew up in the other side of the tracks, a little better neighborhood, but still blue-collar. So we come here. I never owned anything. I still to this day. Then we go to North Carolina, and I get my house again. I'm 57 years old. That's the stupidest thing in the world. Don't buy a house when you're 57. You never get it paid off. You gave me a love offering. I took that love offering. That was my down payment. A very modest house. Beautiful house. It's still there, by the way. We go down to the seat of kids. We drive by it all the time. I've got it now. And this isn't patting me on the back. This is just telling stories. We walked into that, and I said, Debbie, could, could this house make you happy? She said, it's a happy place. It's my happy place. Let's buy it. So we bought it, and we put our personality on it like we always do, and we tweaked this and tweaked that and bought this and this, that, and all, you know, all this stuff. And then four years later, I come back just to visit for an anniversary, and Mike says, how about coming back and helping me, Brother Pat? Well, what the heck am I going to do with my house? Now I'm 60 years old, 61. I got my house, man. I, I like my house. It's, on an, it's almost on an acre. Everybody down there has got an acre of grass, of land. My boy's got more than that. And my wife has the audacity to say, look at me, and she said, Honey, it's only a house. It's just a house. Maybe God wants to give us more fruit in this last season of our life. So you know what God said? Put the for sale sign in the front yard. Now, we put the for sale sign in the front yard, and guess what happened? Three years later, I still had the house. It never sold. And I had people say, must be a sign from God. He didn't want you to go back to Staten Island because the house didn't sell. Well, I didn't believe any of that, but it looked that way. And finally it sold. God may ask you to do some strange things. You know why? He's trying to get you to continue. I could be happy. I'm not lying to you. I could be happy down there. I love North Carolina. But that's not where God wanted me in this last season. So, so be it. So, I, I'm back in the house. That's a whole different story. What am I saying? God's trying to prove you. God may bless you, give you wealth. And then He may say, you know, I want you to do something. And it may cost you. You know what I've realized about Christianity? Everything costs. I want to say it one more time. There ain't no such thing as convenient Christianity. I'm not saying anything about you. That's what I've realized in my life. You know what? God's going to say, dig a little deeper, dig a little deeper, dig a little deeper, dig a little deeper. So you dig a little deeper. And you get aging and you dig a little deeper. And you know what? My wife coined that phrase, he is our guide. Enjoy the ride. Just keep digging a little deeper and a little deeper. There's tests. But you know what he wants you to do? He wants you to trust. He wants you to put your confidence. Psalm 118, gold standard verses 8 and 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. I hope you're not putting confidence in the present, the present administration of the United States of America. I know some of you are. I'm not against it. But it's just a man. 
I'm going to trust in the Lord. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. How sure are you? Remember John chapter 6 and verse 69? This is what Peter said. Now, we all know about Peter's background, and we all know mistakes that he made. Listen to what he said in John chapter 6, verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then you know what he did next? He denied him. Doesn't sound like a man was too sure to me. He was tested and failed. Was God done with him? Doggone Peter. Throw him under the bus. No. 30 years later, he writes two of the greatest books in your Bible, First and Second Peter. But he wasn't sure. Oh, he said he was sure. God wants you, God wants you to taste. He wants you to be, he's going to test you. He's going to prove you. Don't be afraid of it. God's not, God's not mad. And some of us have been tested in this place, and some of us will continue to be tested. Disease and death and discouragement, loss of this, loss of that. And it almost seems like God's picking on you. God's not picking on you. He sees something valuable. He sees some silver that he wants. And he just turns up the temperature until he can see his reflection in the silver. 2 Timothy 2.19 in closing says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. <laughs> and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God knows who you are tonight. And the foundation of... I want something sure. I want... You know what? I want... Fifty years ago, God found me and gave me someone I could trust. Regardless of what society is doing. Man, I look at the news and I heard pastors say it Sunday morning. I'm going to repeat it. I think we're probably going to bounce off things from the, between the two of us for our congregation. You want to know something? Every time I watch the news, I don't care if it's Fox, I don't care if it's conservative, I don't, I, I, I don't care if it's Hannity. Uh, get, you know what? I don't know who's telling me the truth. Everybody's got their own side, their own spin, their own opinion. And I've told you, opinions are like elbows. Everybody's got a couple of them. I had an old preacher, I wasn't old, he was actually a young preacher down south. He said, it's a mighty thin pancake that doesn't have two sides. Mighty thin pancake that doesn't have two sides. But I found a sure, I found that the foundation of God standeth sure. If you ever needed your Bible, and you, you've needed it, believe me, and you know you have. But if you've ever needed, if your family, dads, come on, look at me. Grandpas, if you're any, if you're around your grandchildren, Boy, if your, grand, if, your, if your family ever needed wisdom from God, it's today. You don't know who to trust. And about the time you think you can trust somebody, let me tell you what, you may trust the present, the present administration. Four years, okay, it's almost over. Let's say God gives it four more years. You know, after four, that's eight years. It's over. It's over. Now you got somebody else. You don't think somebody's going to come up with somebody that's going to tear everything was, that the previous administration did? So if you're trusting that, if you're trusting Wall Street, oh, my word, man, you, you need to get a brain check. Man, my parents lived through the Great Depression, 29. There were guys in three-piece suits that were selling apples on street corners. I heard those stories. There were guys jumping out of buildings that all of a sudden were multi-million, probably billionaires. Because that's what they were trusting. Come on. Let's put some confidence. Let's be sure. You know, you know what makes you continue? I closed my Bible. I'm done. I know it's late. 
You know what makes you continue? When you're sure. I'm sure about this book. I'm sure. I've tested it, and it's tested me. And I'm sure. And boy, it gives you a peace and a confidence and a trust and a confidence. It just, it's peaceful. I go home, it's like, my wife sits at that computer sometimes and says, oh, honey, listen to this. I told her the other day, I don't want to hear it anymore. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. What's going to happen? Who did this? Who's going to come back alive? John Kennedy Jr. is coming back to life. I don't really care. Jesus Christ came back to life and changed my life. That's the only thing I care about. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time. I trust, Father, I know your word is always profitable. May our meeting tonight have been profitable for you and profitable for each other. Thank you just for your goodness. Thankful for God's people, my beloved church family. Lord, unite us. One, one accord, one mind, one mouth. Father, carry us, continue to carry us into these days ahead. May we learn to trust, to be sure about what we believe. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God, you're dismissed.